Yeah. Oh, did I have a typo in there or something? Huh? Oh, a single. That makes more sense. Oh, okay. And number three. And number three. <laughs> okay. Oh, here. No, on the on the poster, like what you can have for the exam. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I thought I was just. It's single. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I found a couple of typos in here when I was doing it this morning, so I, I wasn't that surprised when you, when you said that. I was like, eh, where's my other typo? Hi, how are you? Good, I'm good. Okay. So, what is the message? Yes. 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 So, it's a Vibrio. This is the one that's like a crescent. Yep. You know? mm -hmm. Does that do anything? Like, does the structure of the cell itself do anything with the glowing? Does that? No. Or is that Though, that's a great question. I mean, is there some surface area argument to increasing exposure to oxygen or something like that? Not to my knowledge. But I thought it would be a fun question to follow up on because, you know, about the time you say no to that, it's, you know, they'll learn something that. <laughs> That there is some role, you know, in enhancing like maybe surface area. Uh, not to my knowledge. Vibrio as a genus all have that um, kind of crescent shape and not by no means are a majority in that genus um, bioluminescent. So it's not like some feature of the shape of the cell. Yeah. So in that way, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful question, Chantel. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Better. Rocking things along now. Yeah. yeah, good. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. Find me anytime. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am actually. I'm doing good. Yeah. I mean, it's been a little up and down this semester, but today? <laughs> so, yeah. Why not law school? Why not? Yeah, because I just was reading through your introduction again. Yeah. And it seems like that would be more your thing. Um, I don't know. I'm considering it, but yeah, I figure it out. I mean, personal part of me is like I get to push on every day. My dad's an attorney in Rollins. Oh, uh, yeah, so so they're like, no, don't do this. Well, I mean, he's an attorney. My brother's trying to get into law school. So, mm. oh no, it's not that important. So, it's like, because, I mean, someone once said to me, someone very bright once said to me, don't confuse familiarity with love. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing. So, I mean, you know, because your, your, your passions at this point could indicate familiarity more than. Right. I'm just asking, that's yeah. all. Yeah. No, yep. Yep. Good. Yep. Okay. Where are we? Fix this. 
<laughs> there we go, fixed. <laughs> So we're just a couple minutes early, but I thought I would use the time that, of course, I hate to cut into your visiting time, but I hope this will only give you more things to visit about. So uh, firstly, I just wanted to mention that, actually, are Drew, is Drew here today? She was going to make an announcement. You're here. Okay, do you want to do that now? That we do have a microbiology club. Um, and she's just going to give a little plug for that because last semester I was able to give a little bit of extra credit for attending microbiology club meetings, and I think that would be a great thing to do again. So let's hear from her real quick. Okay. So, um, my microbiology club here is called Microbial Minds, and it's a pretty small club, but everyone in it is really nice, and we're pretty flexible about what you guys want to do. So we don't have anything really exactly set up yet, but I think that we're going to um, do a tour of a brewery in Colorado, probably Coors. And then I think we're also trying to get like a cheese tasting thing kind of set up. And we're also going to be working on having a little presentation for the health fair next semester. So we're really going to do a lot of like fun things and networking and stuff. And it's really interesting and maybe every other Wednesday, so not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, I believe. And it's usually from seven to eight. So if you guys want to sign up, all you can sign up to go be here and yep. get on after class. Yeah, and Drew, connect with me, and all of you connect with me, um, because we can get you to the ASM conference, too, if you would like to go to that, because I've got students in Capstone that go, so that's another, would be another really good way to, yeah, right, I mean, give her a hand. <laughs> I mean, what could be better than microbial minds, right? <laughs> so I think there's something interesting in the air this morning, because Sarah and I, I was walking to a meeting and we passed each other in this spot on the way I was going to the ANS building. And then I left the meeting and I passed her in the exact same spot again going the opposite direction. So I think there's some sort of sign that good things are to come, we'll say that. <laughs> um, and on that note, with respect to all the good things that I hope you are creating right now at home in your spare time, uh, a poster, and these are some of the posters of a prior student that I want to pass around. Uh, these are pretty rad-tastic, and I bet as you look at them, you can probably guess what people's majors were uh, based upon how they either are very pictorial or they used a lot of rulers and straight edges of, of various kinds. Um, but I will pass some of these around. By no means are these perfect posters. In fact, I've never seen a perfect poster. So that can be a challenge, right? Challenge accepted, I hope you're thinking. Um, <laughs> this one right here is one of my favorites, actually. I bet you can guess the major of this student. Engineering, right? <laughs> okay, so that one can come around. I hope yours are starting to evolve in similar ways, whether they be on shower curtains, whether they be on a poster board, whether they be on your wall at home. Nobody's taken me up on that one yet, but that would be really cool because you could do your whole dang wall. You could do my wall if you wanted. I would let you come do my basement wall. That would be real sweet. Patrick? That's it. So for the rest of all of the exams you take, this, it comes with you. So what that means is that your exams are not looking to test your rote memorization. They're looking to test your understanding of metabolism, of gene expression, and all of the future topics that we are covering. So please 
take that seriously. And one of the things you'll notice on the vodcast that I offer um, extra credit for is if over spring break you take a picture of yourself working on your poster in a radtastic spot, I will give you extra credit. So for example, you decide you're going to go to Moab for spring break. Take your poster. Work on it on the side of you know, a cliff. Uh, take a picture of it. But when you do that, take me seriously in that just having this, because this exam is not a rote memorization exam, just having this poster isn't going to do you a lick of good. What do you need to do? Understand absolutely everything that you've written on there. So while you're making it, make certain that you're not copying from the notes onto your poster, but that you're creating. And you're asking yourselves, how does this molecule relate to this molecule? Could this molecule maybe you be used to build this one? Could this pathway, does it take place in this compartment of this eukaryotic cell? Where would it take place in a bacterial cell? Could I draw that? Push yourself to understand what you're doing on that poster and to not just be copying. And one of the rules that I have on the poster is that it has to be of your own making. So taking photocopies of metabolic pathways and slapping them onto a poster isn't going to help you learn anything. So in fact, if you do this right, you're actually going to be kind of angry at me during the exam because guess what will happen? You'll never use it. You'll never use the poster because you will know the material. You'll understand it and you'll be able to apply it without the use. So more of this is about process than it is about product. But I also know that you're gonna to wanna to hang on to these for years to come. They're probably gonna decorate your walls at home and they're gonna be utilized in courses ranging from biochemistry to microbial physiology. They will be applied you know, through your med school. In fact, I know that to be true. I got an email from one of my med school students who wants to come back and just hold optional office hours for my biochem in the summer because he still uses his poster from biochem in med school. So this is something to take seriously. Please do make note of my rules. Remember that cells inside of cells, there are no large paragraphs of text. There are no tables. I want you to visually show everything. I also want for this to be on a single sheet, and I'm sorry for the typo uh, that, uh, uh, that Brett found on there. Um, I apologize, but it's a single sheet of any size. So what that means is that I'm not limiting the amount that you can put on there. It's not like the whole note card thing that some professors have given you a chance to bring a note card. And the reason it's a note card is because they want to limit the amount you can get on there. So you write in like, you know, nine point font, and then you can't really even make it out during the exam. Um, this is not the reason. The reason for my single sheet rule is because I want you to cognitively and metacognitively think about what the connections are between absolutely everything that you write down. And if it's not on a single sheet, you've got one piece of paper that's the TCA and one piece of paper that's glycolysis. You don't ever think to yourself, how are these connected? How do they go together? How could I somehow see a connection there? That's why the single sheet rule. Now, you can use the back. Um, some people have even done this on lab coats. So if you ever see some of the TAs wandering around and you're like, ah, that's, that's her metabolism poster. That has been done. So whatever it is you choose, <clears throat> it doesn't matter to me, and the size doesn't matter to me. Does that sound okay? Okay. Rock those out now, starting now, so that you're building your understanding as you're building the posters. Wonderful. I'll be gone next week, as you all know. Monday, we're going to take a risk. I will join you live from New York. Now, here's what I'm going to do. There will be a Zoom session. So I will log in to Zoom. I will get the link, and I will post the link on announcements. In theory, that should enable you from any device anywhere to log in and follow that link and to join the Zoom lecture. That means you could probably do this from home, from the library, from wherever you wanted to be. Additionally, you could do it from class. This might be kind of fun to bring your mobile device or your laptop, log into the Zoom session, but still be watching the lecture here with everyone else. So you could type in your questions from your mobile device and you would, you would see them, you know, see me answering them live. Oh, fingers crossed. That should work out. Okay. I hope so. From what I hear, New York has absolutely no snow. We're going to be skiing on a two and a half K man-made loop. 
So it could be that I'm, I'm joining you from a balmy summer looking location. <laughs> so I'm kind of going to be a little bit strange. Any questions on any of the other things on announcements? Hypotheses, we're rolling along on them. The sooner I get those, the sooner I can finalize them for you and you can move along with your project. Mm -hmm. well, <coughs> So assuming that everything goes super smoothly on Monday, then that session will be recorded. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to say that everything will go super swimmingly, but I hope it does. I sure hope it does. Yeah. So it, it's a risk to miss class that day. Okay. Beautiful. I think we should jump in because I am super jazzed about metabolism and I want to make sure that we get this journey through glycolysis under our belt. Last time when we left off, we had just looked at the first step of glycolysis. All of you had helped me out with the negative delta G overall of hydrolysis when ATP transfers a phosphoryl group onto ADP. Ah, oh. too many buttons. So remember that this reaction in which ATP is consumed, making ADP and glucose 6-phosphate, overall, I think we figured out that the delta G, the negative delta G, was it negative 14 or something like that? When we looked, we used negative 16. When we used our table of phosphoryl group transfer potentials, we know that that reaction is overall exergonic. But what was consumed to allow it to be so? ATP. So this is super confusing and it took me forever to realize how confusing this would be to you this reaction is overall exergonic but at this point in time what does it appear that this pathway is endergonic good job you rock so if you see a pathway that's consuming a ton of atp you're saying well the pathway itself is needing energy in order to go. The pathway itself is endergonic, even though coupling this one reaction to ATP did make the one reaction release free energy, but it needed the ATP to do so. So this is kind of depressing, actually, if you think about it. We're in this pathway that's supposed to yield energy. It's supposed to be catabolic. And so far, it looks like we're in the hole. So our ATP bank account looks dis dismally negative so remember that this reaction occurs when, um, usually when glucose is being transported into the cell. And I'm going to answer Jake's question. But think about while I'm doing that, what did we call that kind of, of transport? Right, right. He's asking the chicken and the egg argument, like how did glycolysis ever start if there was no ATP that was made? And like, doesn't, you know, if there was no glycolysis, how did ATP get made? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to think about it as some point there was a high energy phosphoryl, um, a molecule with high, high energy phosphoryl transfer potential that could make ATP. So, I mean, I think that's an argument we can always take in circles, which is fun for sure. Um, but what do we call that kind of transport if something's modified as it's transported into the cell? Group translocation. Yeah, yeah. So that's what's going on there. So the group, group translocator brings glucose in, modifies it. We get glucose 6-phosphate. Now, I promised you last time that you'd never have to memorize another enzyme name, and I hope that that can be the case. What does hexo mean? Six, okay. And if I tell you that additionally, kinase, actually, you know, because you know, I used it in one homework. What was it? Phosphorylates. So this enzyme phosphorylates six carbon sugars, hexokinase. So even if I didn't put an enzyme name on this reaction, you would have a pretty good idea of how to name that enzyme. And that's what we're going to see for all of these enzymes. The second step of glycolysis, if you don't know chemistry, seems like a waste. Because all it is is a rearrangement between glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. Watch this happen. Boom. Right? I mean, what ha really what happened there? Um, we went from a, a what membered ring? 6 to a 5. A anybody think of a reason? Like the, maybe even if, you know, I was thinking of Madison, even if you know art rather than knowing What's different about that? Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, yeah. And oh, that's such a perfect way to say that. Because um, do you remember when they did that whole article on, wasn't it um, Denzel Washington, who they said was like the most good looking person alive because he's exactly, yeah, he's exactly what? Symmetric. And that's the reason for this, is it's a change towards symmetry. And if you think about the fact that the goal of glycolysis is the splitting of a, of a sugar, what's going to be likely of a five-membered ring versus a six? It's going to split evenly. And that's the point of this, is symmetry, trying to make this so this will split evenly. So oddly, in fact, uh, maybe pun intended, step number two is really, really important. And although we didn't write a, an enzyme name on this step, I will just tell you that any time you see a rearrangement like this, that's typically catalyzed by some sort of mutase. So anytime you see an enzyme named a mutase, that's just catalyzing a rearrangement. There's no change in the number of carbons, but they were rearranged. Fructose 6-phosphate in the third step, which I would call the most epically important step of glycolysis, is going to get doubly phosphorylated. So again, increasing the symmetry, right? It's going to go from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate with, yes, the investment of yet another ATP. So we can anticipate that the overall delta G hydrolysis of this step is going to be negative, but yet it seems that so far all we're doing is investing energy. So we could say that in the first steps of glycolysis, everything appears to be pretty darn endergonic consuming a lot of ATP. What is our bank account at this point? Negative two, it's dismal, right? We have netted nothing, and yet we have invested two ATP. Let's take a quick look at the increased symmetry that comes when fructose 6-phosphate goes to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. There's another ATP getting invested, and bingo, right? So we just see this change in it being a doubly phosphorylated molecule. This, as you probably would have guessed, is going to be named a kinase because there was a phosphoryl group transfer that took place. And you might have further guessed that it was going to be called fructose 6-phosphate kinase. For short, it's called phosphofructokinase. So pretty straightforward. We give this a nickname. We almost always call it PFK. And there's actually two different forms of PFK, PFK1 and PFK2. We'll talk more about that in more advanced classes. But for now, just know that PFK is the most epic enzyme ever. Because I want to take your attention back to, like, Corey's group's uh, uh, canyoneering trip that they're taking. Notice something. They had a giant rappel right here and another giant rappel right there. Those two steps are what we call metabolically irreversible. There is no return. In fact, if those are ever going to go backwards, there has to be alternate reactions, kind of like when you're in the canyon. Sometimes you can get around a pour-off by doing some epic climbing adventure kind of on an alternative route. But this is a point of no return. This is a repel step. So what can you tell me is likely going to be true? of phosphofructokinase, what kind of enzyme can we anticipate it will be? Okay, say that again. Okay, yeah, it will be inhibited by what sorts of things, Scott? You were telling me the other. Yes, allosterically, right? But what sorts of allosteric mo molecules? Yeah. Good, products. So we're expecting that PFK is going to be shut down, down-regulated by some sort of product, allosterically, at a site other than its active site. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, forecasting of what that molecule is going to be right here in step nine of glycolysis. The molecule called PEP is formed also known as phosphoenolpyruvate. And that molecule is going to feed back, inhibit PFK allosterically. So it's going to negatively regulate PFK. What else might you think would be true of PFK besides being feedback inhibited? It might also be 
the reverse of that. What would be the reverse of that? Amplified, right? Activated. So if we have feedback inhibition, what do we have on the other side? Feed forward activation. Okay. So in many cases, we expect regulated enzymes like these to be regulated by some sort of reactant to upregulate them. The, the activation of PFK is complicated, and there is some feed forward activation. We're not going to go into all the details of what it is. But interestingly, PFK is feed forward activated um, by AMP and ADP. And I want you to think about that. So this step is the first committed step of glycolysis. We know it's regulated both um, allosterically by both phosphoenolpyruvate or PEP, but it's also feed forward activated by ADP. And at first glance, that seems wicked odd, right? Because we look at ADP and we say, wait, that's a product of step three. We wouldn't expect that to activate. But think again, what does high ADP indicate? Excellent. Consumption of ATP. So overarchingly, high ADP indicates low ATP. It indicates a need for the glycolytic pathway to get itself moving. So ADP regulates PFK and says, there's need in this cell for more ATP, make more. So it makes, it makes PFK make this step go faster and eventually net more ATP. So PFK, an epically awesome, I would say the most important step right here, metabolically irreversible, heavily regulated, big time damning point in, um, in glycolysis, Patrick. Yeah. Don't think of it as my time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. You're just chilling out, right? Uh, totally. Yeah, totally committed and yet totally downhill. And so I love that analogy because we could say that this is the hang gliding ledge right here where, you know, you're going to make that jump. You know, there's going to be energy put in to make that jump, but now everything is downhill. So as we go from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and we split that into two, three carbon intermediates. This is the step that glycolytic pathways are named for, the splitting of something sweet, splitting from a six carbon sugar to two, three carbon intermediates. And we're gonna get the formation of two molecules, um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Now I want you to watch this happening um, in, uh, let me clear things so you can actually watch this happening. Um, in this set of steps, I want you to look at the fact that two things happen. First, we split from a six carbon molecule to two three carbon molecules, but then I want you to watch closely what happens next and see if you can explain it. Here is our six carbon molecule, splitting to two three, and then what just happened there? Yeah. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate, I've never heard of DHAP, I love that. We're, I'm going to use that all the time now. DHAP was totally converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. What does that mean about the state in between those two 3-carbon molecules? They are in what with one another? Yeah, that might have been right what you said, but there's a term. Equilibrium, yeah. So what we know about equilibria is that if one product within that equilibrium is pulled away, then everything will shift towards that molecule. So that's what happens here. Everything shifts towards glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate because it is the reactant for the next step of glycolysis. So it's the one that's pulled away, and therefore the equilibrium towards glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is favored. We now have a stoichiometry of two in front of everything. Now, two inorganic phosphates and the addition of those onto glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will be coupled to the oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. 
check it out. Patrick's hang gliding analogy works miracles because we're finally getting the pay dirt. We're just chilling out and energy is getting made because we know that NADH is worth a lot of ATP. Wait a minute. When is it worth a lot of ATP? Yeah, only when the ETC is going. Otherwise, it simply represents something that has to be reconverted to NAD+, and that's what fermentation does. So it only represents energy if the ETC is going. But let's, let's be optimistic and say the ETC is going, right? And that it does represent energy. So now as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is converted to the next intermediate, we're starting to feel optimistic about the world. Not only have we now net reducing power, but we have net something called 1,3-BPG. Recognize it? Where do you, from where do you recognize it? Yeah, and what was true of it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, it's right under PP on that table. How much energy is in its bonds? Negative 49. Is that enough to make ATP? You bet. So we have just made an epically high energy molecule, 1,3-BPG, with 49 kilojoules per mole pent up in its bonds. It can easily transfer a phosphoryl group onto ADP to make ATP, and that is what it is going to do. Okay, so sorry, this was the last step, coupling NADH to, uh, or the, the oxidation to the phosphorylation to get 1,3-BPG. And then now we see the pay dirt of ATP. So now we're feeling a lot better about our bank account. Where does it currently stand? Zero. Okay, so, you know, I mean, we haven't met anything yet, but at least we're no longer in the hole by two. So everything sits at zero. As we go from 1,3-BPG to 3-PG and we make two ATPs, everything looks better with that bank account. So here is our wicked high energy, 1,3-BPG, ADP, gets phosphorylated to make ATP. Yes. Yes. Good. I love that. Yes, they do. It's a wonderful question. So these reactions that we're meeting now, unlike this one and this one, are in equilibrium, which means that if the tides turn or regulation shifts, this pathway will go backwards. Does anybody want to speculate the name of the pathway? Patrick, you, you be quiet because I know you know this. Okay, so speculate the name. If, the, if, if this is glycolysis, breaking down glucose, lysing glucose, what would it be called to build glucose? Gluconeogenesis, right? Making glucose. So that pathway can go, but wait a minute. What about these repels? You can't just like superhero up those repels. What's going to have to happen there? Yes, a bypass reaction. You're going to have to hike way around, you know, way out of your way to get up over that repel. So there is going to have to be a, a lot of energy invested. And additionally, there's going to have to be alternative enzymes, right, for that. Okay? So beautiful job. Beautiful job. Wonderful stuff to bring up. So now we find ourselves at a bank account of zero because now a substrate level phosphorylation event, much as Riley said, that occurred in our calculation last hour, brings us to zero ATP. And it also brings us, interestingly enough, to another one of these rearrangement reactions in which 3-phosphoglycerate simply gets converted to 2-phosphoglycerate. Anybody want to speculate on an enzyme name there? Okay, not a kinase. This one's going to be the kinase, right, because there's a phosphoryl transferred. But if this one is just a rearrangement? A mutase, so phosphoglycerol mutase or something like that, phosphoglycerate mutase. You can look it up. Go see if we're right. Because we're not memorizing any more enzyme names. That's just ridiculous stuff. Um, so uh, let's look it up and see if we're right. Okay, wonderful. So now we find ourselves having rearranged. Let's look at that. So going from, uh, it seems so silly, right? All that happened there was the movement 
of the phosphoryl group from carbon one to carbon two. But this, it can more easily be converted into the next intermediate, which is an extremely high energy molecule that we find at the very top of our table. What is it? PP, right. So this is finally the making of that epically high energy PEP, phosphoenolpyruvate. And those of you who speak chemistry, I don't know why this is, but like the one thing I remember from organic, I know shh, I like really only remember one thing, I think. No, I'm kidding. But um, it's sometimes you, we, we learn really regurgitatively or bulimically in organic chemistry. But I hope you remember that the enol keto tautomerization, the ketone is always favored in that. And so that's because enols are strictly really high in energy, right? They're very unstable. So PEP is so high in energy because it's an extremely unstable phosphoenol, right? Enol is very unstable. So we recognize PEP that we wrote in earlier, phosphoenol pyruvate. Sorry, it's cutting off the edge there, but we already wrote it in before. And we know phosphoenol pyruvate, um, Ryan, how much is in its bonds? 62 kilojoules per mole. Man, there, <laughs> there's enough to make two. But we also understand quantization of energy. That's not going to be a thing. But there's going to be a whopper of, of en energy given off in this reaction, right? The delta G of hydrolysis is going to be huge. So two ATPs are made. And why are we now celebrating our bank account? What is our net total? Yeah, I know Hannah's going to get that. I pick on you on the vodcast, too. You're like our, our keeper of the information that there are two ATPs net via substrate level phosphorylation total from glycolysis. So this is the making of our actual net outcome, um, our net worth of glycolysis. And of course, as all of you reminded me last time, 2-pyruvate are sort of the product of, of this pathway. Now, one thing that's really neat about glycolysis is that the stoichiometry is one to one to one. And by that I mean, there's a net of how many ATP? Two. There's a net of how many NADHs? Two. There's a net of how many pyruvates? Two. Isn't that cool? Two, two, two. That is what comes out of glycolysis. That being said, let's practice a question together looking at overall net yield. Before we do that, what just happened in step 10? Another what? So, yes, good. Substrate level phosphorylation. Excellent job. But also, what about this arrow? Tell me about this arrow. It's another pour off, right? It's another repel. It is another metabolically irreversible step. Oh, and who, who could think of the name of that enzyme? I bet you could. Okay, we know it's going to have at least what in its name? Kinase, right? Good. So we recognize this as another metabolically highly regulated step, like the PFK step, like the hexokinase step. These are points of regulation that occur um, in glycolysis. So three metabolically irreversible steps, three major points of regulation. One might think to oneself, well, why is step 10 regulated? That's not early in a pathway. Remember talking about how usually enzymes early in a pathway are regulated? What pathway is it early in? Gluconeogenesis. Right? When this pathway turns backwards, it's step number one of the backwards pathway. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You wouldn't go through it if you didn't need to, to net ATP, right? You didn't need ATP, but you did need what? Glucose. When would that be true? What fuel would, uh, would a cell be running on? where it didn't need ATP, but it did need glucose. Mm. Okay, yeah, but remember that photosynthesis is, is synthesizing glucose via the Kelvin cycle. Yeah. Okay, so lactic acid is the product of glycolysis if there is no what running? No ETC running, right? So it's one product of fermentation, lactic acid is. Lactic acid could fuel gluconeogenesis, but I think somebody said the right answer. A cell that has plenty of ATP but doesn't have enough glucose is one that is fueled off of 
what fuel could be given a lot of energy, but no, no source of glucose. Fat, right? It's going to be fat. Because remember, fats are going right onto the TCA cycle, pumping out a lot of reducing power and a lot of ATP. But the cell will be glucose starved. So it will be making glucose. And you know, this is particularly pertinent in a human system because we can only run this on what? Glucose. So if you're eating only fats, you're going to have to run gluconeogenesis all the time in order to make glucose to fuel your brain. So that's one of those interesting arguments against uh, Atkins diet. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So let's look at a question that I want you to figure the answer to. And well, so you're generating more energy from a fat than you would from glucose, but it's just that certain tissues and certain things can't run off of fat. So you have to make glucose. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm working right now on the microbial correlation there, so give me some thinking time on that. But hey, let's, it, how's the poster coming? Let's see. We need to make sure that in your poster and the side is all, all this action is going on. We know that we see an ATP invested in step one. Where else do we see an ATP invested? Step, not two, three. Right, remember step two is just a rearrangement. Where do we see the first ATP that we get out? Okay, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. That's where we need to now say that we're going to get two ADPs to two ATPs. Now we're out of the hole. And then lastly, when we make the pyruvate step 10 or the last step. So again, this is how we're thinking as we're creating our posters, right? Cool. So now let's do um, a quick calculation. This is a very easy calculation, but I find that the minute that I throw numbers at you, you get scared sometimes. So let's see how just easy this really is. So let's say that we've got an organism that is living on a glucose salt auger plate. It utilizes 3.34 times 10 to the 21st molecules of glucose. And we want to know how much ATP can be net by the Abgen Meyerhoff, aka glycolytic pathway, and how much reducing power is created in NADHs. This is an easy calculation because we're only looking at the Ebden Meyerhoff pathway. We're not looking at anything but glycolysis. So do it real quick. Easy peasy. Cancel units. Please cancel units. Please always cancel units. Please celebrate unit cancellation. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But celebrate unit cancellation as you do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. That's as easy as that. But I just, I want you to, I want everyone to be canceling units right now. So, it just feels good. It just, you know, you're going to find the more you cancel units, the more you thrive in your life. It's just going to be a thing. So if we have 3.34 times 10 to the 21st glucose molecules, how many ATP per glucose? Okay, so two ATP per every glucose. Just always do it. It feels good. It's just good. So now we know we're going to get, what is that, 6.68 times 10 to the 21st ATP. Now why did I say, could I say that we're pretty much done here? 
what would be true of the calculation for NADH? It's exactly the same, only, of course, you would change your units, right? Okay, wonderful. So remember not to get scared when you see one of these number questions, because quite frequently they're quite easy, especially if you have your poster and you're like, oh, yeah, glycolysis nets too. Easy peasy, right? Okay. So moving along, we get rid of these. It's very important to note that the ebden meyerhoff pathway is not the only glycolytic pathway. There are others. Another glycolytic pathway is called the pentose phosphate pathway, though I actually quite prefer the alternative nomenclature of the hexose monophosphate shunt. The reason I like the hexose monophosphate shunt better, for numerous reasons, it's just a better name, but also it describes kind of what it does. It takes glucose 6-phosphate, the first intermediate of glycolysis, and shunts it over to another pathway. This pathway has the purpose of yielding two things. It yields a whole lot of ribonucleotides for synthesis of what epically important molecule. In what do we find ribonucleotides? RNA and DNA. So if a cell wants to synthesize RNA and DNA, it would be in its best interest to run the hexose monophosphate shunt or the pentose phosphate pathway. Additionally, this pathway yields a lot of NADPH. What does NADPH do with its electrons? No, but that's where we, our mind usually goes, right? We always like, oh, ETC, man, it's gonna take its electrons, ETC, ETC it's gonna make energy, but NADPH is different, where does it go? Okay, yes, Scott, but also say that more broadly. Other metabolic pathways, specifically what type of metabolic pathway? Anabolic, building pathways. It gives its electrons to anabolism. Whatever those anabolisms might be, it also does something else interesting that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Uh, let's say this. It has a lot of reducing power, and it can be used in anabolism and, and some other interesting ways. This also occurs in cytoplasmic ma matrix of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. It can operate at the same time as the ebden meyerhoff pathway. And I want you to think about why it might benefit a cell to run both, possibly. It also operates anaerobically or aerobically, aka it doesn't utilize oxygen in any way. It doesn't require that terminal electron acceptor. That's not something that it directly uses. So I don't want you to necessarily add every minute detail of the pentose phosphate pathway to your poster, but I broadly want you to add it to your poster because it does net some interesting things, and I want to show you broadly what the pathway looks like. Beginning with glucose 6-phosphate, as I promised would be true, remember the hexose monophosphate shunt, so it's a hexose glucose, monophosphate, one phosphate on carbon six, they get shunted over into this pathway. Now, the steps that generate NADPH begin. As glucose six phosphate gets converted into phosphogluconate, we actually see it generate uh, an NADPH, but this continues throughout what we call the oxidative stages. So step one and step three of the oxidative stages of the pathway net NADPH. If a cell needs to build a lot of stuff, that is when an anabolic pathway needs to be upregulated, we know that the oxidative stages of the penose phosphate pathway are going to be really important to that cell. Now let's get egocentric just a little bit because we can say Dylan's had a super hard workout and he's extremely basically like uh, limping around, he's a little sore, he's his pentose phosphate pathway. Why? He's just sore. It's like the next day. Now he's chilling out eating popsicles in front of the TV. I bet you don't even eat sugar, but, um, you know, so, so let's say what's going on in his, his body now. Yes. A lot of them died, right? That's the whole thing about supercompensation. You're killing a lot of stuff just to build it back stronger, 
right? That's what supercompensation is. So he is running pentose phosphate pathway a lot because he is trying to build it back stronger. So this pathway is going to help building back after healing, the need to heal. Anabolic pathways are going to be important in that. The other thing that's interesting, catch this, NADPH also uses its electrons to make sure to keep the, um, the iron at the heart of hemoglobin in the ferrous rather than the ferric form. And does anybody know what happens if that iron is not kept reduced in hemoglobin? Yeah, it oxidizes and it causes the red blood cell to sickle, right? Sickle cell. So interestingly, this does relate highly to microbiology because if this first enzyme, which, oh, hey, by the way, we can guess a name for it, because anytime you see the generation of reducing power, NADH, NADPH, or FADH2, the enzyme is always named the name of the substrate plus dehydrogenase. So what is likely the name of this enzyme? Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So if someone is deficient in that enzyme, then they have sickle cell. And what is true of people who have sickle cell trait, or at least are, you know, they have that, you know, tendency, they don't get malaria because the parasite can't live in their blood. Isn't that crazy? So it's directly related to microbiology. <laughs> so anyway, this is the oxidative stages. The non-oxidative stages, that's when we see the formation of the precursor metabolite. Catch that terminology? Precursor metabolite for DNA and RNA synthesis, ribose 5-phosphate. If a cell needs to make lots of DNA and RNA, the pathway stops here. Done. So remember, this will serve as the building block for DNA and RNA. However, sometimes a cell needs NADPH to keep its anabolism going, but it doesn't need ribose 5-phosphate to build DNA. So therefore, the ribose 5-phosphate will be converted into some molecules that I think you're going to recognize. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, and another fructose 6-phosphate. From where do you recognize those three molecules? Yes, the ebden meyerhoff pathway, or what we often term glycolysis. Yes, so that's why we can actually see this as like a shunt off of the side of glycolysis, mm -hmm. because we can see that these can feed back into glycolysis. Okay, so my yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Like, could glucose 6-phosphate go backwards to glucose? Sure. Okay. Um, and that's, a, that's also a question of a gluconeogenesis and how that happens. There's actually some confounding issues about how that happens, but, it, but that would be the idea of gluconeogenesis, that that could go backwards. Um, uh, there's, that one's a meta, like, that's a metabolically irreversible step, so there's a bypass. This one? Oh, all this is about is that I don't want to tell you all the details that are there. I, I just kind of want you to know the basics, you know. And hey, so let's actually see, could we draw this onto our uh, poster? And actually, I'm, I might have to go, I'm going to have to go back really quick. Oh, glycolytic intermediates, right? You recognize them, right? Okay, where is my poster? I need to, to find it. Ah, oh, no, Rachel. Right, so this is quick review. This is, this is how you study when you procrastinate, right? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I've got it. I'm going to pass. <laughs> okay. Solid. Oh, yes, there it is. Phosphoenopyruvate. <laughs> Epic. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> totally. I mean, that's effective. <laughs> okay, so as we look at how we might hexose monophosphate shunt this off, 
<clears throat> you'd be taking glucose 6-phosphate. And I'm really going to be lazy here, everyone, because I don't have enough room to really do this justice. I'm just going to say pentose phosphate pathway. And the glucose 6-phosphate could go through that. And we know it would give off NADPH. It would give off ribose 5-phosphate. Sorry, it's not really in the mitochondria, and I just don't have that much room. And then we would get glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, check that, and fructose 6-phosphate as the possible products there. So see how that really does look like a shunt? I mean, it really does. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to go off, and then you can draw the arrows back, so you can <clears> the ones you can Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you could think about why, why a cell might want to run both the penose phosphate pathway and glycolysis, like or Ebden Meyerhoff pathway. You could think about like why would that, why would that be? Um, sometimes people ask, well, why wouldn't it always run penose phosphate? Because what does it lose? Because notice that these come back, those intermediates come back before anything gets net, right? So the thought is, well, why would you do that? But it's important to note that every time penose phosphate is run, there's one carbon lost. So if it's run six times, what's lost? One glucose. So there is a charge, even though it doesn't seem as really obvious, but it is a charge. Yes, go ahead. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I know, right? We make those, like those, those um, what is it, like memory devices, and it's not true. But think, if you can just think about it as it is, it does fuel biosynthesis, yeah. Yes, and we do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and, and we have to, right? Just think about the whole sickle cell thing. We're, we, we have to produce any DPH. We uh, think of Dylan healing. We need, we have to make any DBH. We need it for anabolism. We, yeah, so humans uh, and others. It, uh, it's interesting because there are some bacteria, particularly soil bacteria, that only run this pathway called the etner deuterov pathway. I like to call the etner deuterov pathway the two-in-one shampoo. And let's see why I might make that um, analogy. Okay, it does two things at once. It is found mostly in bacteria like Pseudomonas, Azotobacter, Agrobacterium, and Rhizobium. If you know and love soil, you will recognize those as being epic soil dwellers. They are bacteria that are phenomenal in the nitrogen cycle, fixation of nitrogen. Um, Agrobacterium, remember, is the primary means of creating GMOs. It's the one that is given to uh, plant cells to modify their genome because it, plas it, it, it passes a plasmid to the plant. So these are really famous bacteria, soil microbes. We now know that the Edner deuterov pathway is used in other bacteria besides soil microbes, but it's very prevalent in soil microbes. Here is the way we would describe the Edner deuterov pathway. First, we're going to see steps that look similar to the penose phosphate pathway. In the first couple steps, we're going to think, ah, this is the penose phosphate pathway. And then we're going to look at the last steps, those in the trio stages or the three carbon stages. And we're going to be like, ah, that's the ebden meyerhoff pathway or glycolysis. So this pathway literally puts together elements of both the penose phosphate pathway and the ebden meyerhoff pathway or glycolysis. Let's take a look at it. And I want you to see those familiar elements in here. In the first step, we look at glucose 6-phosphate going to 6-phosphogluconate, which is going to net NADPH. Looks like what pathway? PPP. It looks like the penose phosphate pathway, PPP for short. However, notice now that the phosphogluconate gets broken down into a molecule that is then split. This is the, the splitting of the 6-carbon into 3 to one pyruvate, so done, right? Done, totally done. But then glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, from where do we recognize that? Glycolysis, right? And now look, that goes to 1,3-BPG, and then 3-PPG, and then 2-PG, and then PP, and then that all looks like glycolysis, right? And it nets the same thing. And NADH, what's next? What's net by 1,3-BPG? 
right? Say it more with more conviction. What's not by 13 BPG? ATP, right? High energy, really high energy. It's going to net ATP. And then, of course, PP nets ATP. So count it up. What is the yield of the Etner Deutero pathway total? Yes, one ATP and one NADH and one NADPH. Weird, right? Another one to one to one. One NADPH, one NADH, one ATP. Why does it seem like kind of the two in one shampoo? It can provide for what? Anabolism with the NADPH, but it can also make ATP and NADH for energy generation. So it's actually getting both jobs done. So let's put the tally down here, and we'll stop um, there. I realize, but I just wanted to get through that. Um, yeah, Elaine. Doesn't that yield two ATP? No, because let's count up. Like here is one, oh, right? Okay. Input. Yeah, and then zero, and then one. Yeah, yeah. A good what? Complementary rubate isn't considered in the night yield. Like, because you, you make one a rubate. Yeah. How can we um, well, we, we could also say that two pyruvates are produced in the same, yes. So if you wanted to add on there two pyruvates, that would also be something that was the product, right, of the pyruvate. Because there's one up above, right? So when the molecule's broken down, there's one. And then at the very bottom. Yep, yep. No, most bacteria that run the energy growth, that's all they have. There are some exceptions where they actually run both, which is interesting, but mostly this is an alternative. Oh, yeah. 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 It's often in addition to at the Meyer House. So this one's like an alternative for the oh, most okay, part. Okay, okay. Yep. It's like these soil bacteria use this instead. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep, yeah. Oh, gosh, yes, and I forgot to mention I can't be in open lab right now, but it is happening, so feel free to go there. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, Dave. Yeah, that's fine. I just didn't see that. I just thought it was, oh, yeah, okay, they're letting me.